Hello, hello. Welcome back to Mistress of the Damned. I am your Mistress Katrina. How are you doing today? If you are new to my channel, this is where I read through the enormous library books that is not currently behind me because I am boxing them up from preparation of putting in some new flooring sometime next month. Um, anyways, if you like books, if you're not sure what to read, if you just want a synopsis of a book, I uh, haven't read them all yet, but I'm working my way through it hit that subscribe button to stay in the loop and I'm always looking for book recommendations. So if you have something, toss it in the comments. On to this week's book. Now, I was having lunch last month with a friend of mine and we got to talking about politics as one does. And I said something like, I don't know that Trump was the worst president ever, but then again, he might've been. I just don't know that much about our former presidents. I mean, outside of the ones in my lifetime, I could think, I think I can name maybe 10 of them out of the 46 which is pretty appalling. Uh, other than Washington, Adams, and Jefferson, I'm not sure I could even name the key achievements of any of them. So I decided to remedy that. And I'm going to read a book a month on a president in order of their presidency. This gives me kind of a nice couple years buffer before I got to start digging into the people who've served in my lifetime, since I'm not a particular fan of any of them. To that end, this week's book is, let's see if I can get a good shot of it, no, because it's very reflective. His Excellency George Washington by Joseph J. Ellis. Well, I got a lot of reflection off that bad boy. Anyways, um, this is very, it's a short book. It's a synopsis, more than a detailed reading. It's 200 some pages, 275 pages. Um, there are much bigger books on Washington's life. Again, he was born on February 22nd, 1732, died December 14th, 1799. That's 67 years and approximately nine months of life, and he did a lot of living in that life. There are books that are more voluminous on this topic, commenting on every move he made basically from birth until his final moments here on God's Green Earth. Joseph Ellis stated early on in his book that his goal was to kind of hit the highlights that encapsulated Washington's life without spending too much time in the uh, weeds in details while bringing an element of humanity to this thoroughly iconic individual. Um, and I think he succeeded. Uh, Washington is one of those historical figures that people are prone to either canonizing or vilifying, right? I mean, very few people find that balance between hero worship of everything he did and demonization for what he didn't do. Um, and people tend to forget that he was wholly human. I mean, larger than life, I mean, unquestionably, and in many ways, and I don't just mean physically. He was six foot three inches tall, which is tall for today, but was absolutely enormous back in the 18th century. But his character, by all reports, tended to fill a room, all right? He, he just, larger than life. And he was, without a doubt, the preeminent figure of the American Revolution and the fledgling country that grew out of it. Um... For all these things, he was canonized, and, and rightly so. He was a remarkable man. More recently, he's been villainized for his stance, or rather lack thereof, on the question of slavery that presented itself while the nation was forming. And I, I gotta go with it. It's, it's right to vilify him for that. It, it was a seminal moment. But we'll get to there. Um, well, Ellis doesn't shy away from this question. He tackles it head on in several passages, but it's also kind of a running theme throughout the book, which makes sense. It should be, it's a huge hypocrisy to have, on one hand, the founding father of a nation built on freedom owning slaves. And the, the two ideas really don't mesh well together. And part of that is the humanity that made Washington not only human, but a product of his time. And you genuinely cannot paint somebody with a brush meant for today who lived 200 years ago, okay? Today, we know slavery was evil. Back then, he got there eventually, but it wasn't anything he gave serious thought to until the revolution, okay? Anyways, now for the rundown. The book is broken into segments of Washington's life, okay? He basically identified seven major segments of his life. Um, his early life, when he was a member of the Continental Militia under the King, after his early military career when he retired more or less to become a country squire and he, he focused a lot of his time to building his estate. That's when he married Martha Custis. 
um, just prior to and then during the war when he accepted the position of commander of the Continental Forces. And then during the wars, he shifted tactics to those that led us to victory. There was a brief interlude where he effectively retired. Um, he, he did not intend to come back and be president. And, and there's literally no indication that that was anywhere on his, his radar. He was retired. He wanted to enjoy his retirement. Um, but when he was called back to service, he, you know, served as the first president. Well, first he oversaw the... the um, God. <laughs> Continental D. Oh my God. Constitutional Convention. There it is. See? My notes aren't all that thorough. Constitutional Convention. He oversaw that and then was made president unanimously. And then finally his well-deserved retirement, which was the real thing. And he didn't enjoy, get to enjoy very long before he passed away. Now... Washington was not the oldest child. I think there were seven Washington children altogether, and he had no real expectation of inheriting anything, although he did eventually end up inheriting about 2,500 acres from his brother, um, and that's where he built Mount Vernon. Uh, his brother Lawrence followed family tradition by dying fairly young. In fact, most of Washington's immediate family died by the age of 50. So living to 67 was a pretty solid feat in and of itself. Uh, he spent, Washington, spent several years in the military, kicking around the wilds west of the Allegheny Mountains, where he was an active campaigner during the French and Indian Wars. Uh, and this is where one of the running themes of his life, as identified by Joseph Ellis, first appeared. Uh, Washington was not initially a super successful soldier. I mean, he obviously understood the tactics. But reading through this section of the book, it does not appear to be all that promising that Washington would later go on to become the general who led us to victory. The entire section kind of catalogs one military failure after another. But as Ellis points out, Washington had a remarkable character trait that was pretty unique back then, and it's, it's not all that common these days either, which is that Washington could learn from his mistakes. Following a loss, Washington inevitably did better the next time around, snatching victory from defeat again and again. And this is a skill set that followed him throughout his life. This theme of learning from mistakes and winning after defeat repeated throughout Washington's lifetime. It's very likely, and Ellis lays out a strong argument for it, that prior to marrying Martha Custis, he was in love with the wife of a friend of his. Uh, her name, I believe, was Sally Fairfax, I think. But he was a man of honor. The lady was married to one of his best friends. And so he set his sights on the newly widowed Martha Custis, who brought with her an enormous dower estate, which he added to his ever-growing holdings. So in addition to the 2,500 acres he inherited from his brother, he now had his wife's estate to manage, as well as several thousand acres in the Ohio Valley and western Pennsylvania, which were apportionments he claimed as part of his military service to Britain. Um... There's some hmm, historical hinkery going on there. Britain basically said, no, we're, we're going to apportion that to the Indians. Washington realized that expansion was inevitable and figured if he played by Britain's rules, he would lose the holding. So he said, I'm just going to hold them anyways. And he did. All of this um, contributed to his wealth significantly. Now, he was not a poor man by any metric, okay, he had wealth, but it was all in land holdings. Uh, cash assets were not always immediately available. And it was while he was managing his holdings during this interlude between military service to Britain and military service to America um, that Washington came to the conclusion that it's a short trip to the poorhouse to sink all of your crops into tobacco. Um, the market in Europe was largely managed through agents. Since he couldn't control the sale himself, consequently had to pay a middleman, which cut into his bottom line. So Washington determined that tobacco was a no-go. That's how you end up very poor. He determined the only plant, or excuse me, he determined to only plant what could be sold locally and sustain himself. Um, he shifted his crops to grains and vegetables. This decision, along with all the land he accumulated over a lifetime, ensured that when he died, his net worth was $503,000. Doesn't sound like much in today's money, right? But at the time, that made him one of the wealthiest people in America, hands down. When the 
political situation in England reached its boiling point and war seemed inevitable, Washington was called on to head the army. Uh, this is also where he was first called His Excellency, and this title followed him throughout the war. Now, throughout the chapters on the Revolution, the pattern repeats. Washington seems to lose repeatedly, followed by successes. He had no delusions that a passionate militia could take down a fully trained British military. Um, he, he didn't for one second believe that, and that was worn out by multiple battles where the militia got their butt kicked by the British military. But he did come to realize and eventually embrace the fact that he would have to fight a Fabian military tactic, which is kind of that hit and run guerrilla style warfare that we come to associate with the American Revolution, right? And people are like, oh, that was unheard of in military tactic. No, it wasn't. That's why it's called a Fabian, right? It's a Roman thing going way back when of this hit and, hit and run style of tactic. Excuse me. Um, but it wasn't considered honorable. Okay, honorable was that stand and deliver fight where the two lines face each other and they shoot at each other until one army falls, right? That That's the honorable way to do that. It's a quick way to die, but that was the honorable thing to do. Um, once he decided that that was not going to win the war and that in order to win, you had to do this hit and run style, he was all in. He went for it. Took longer, obviously, instead of being over in the very short time everybody seemed to think it would be. It dragged on for eight years, eight years. He was 43 when he went in, 51 when he went out. That's eight years. Okay. Anyways, um, after the war, that's kind of when his true greatness came to light. I mean, he was already remarkable because he led us to this victory that was unprecedented. Nobody expected it to happen. But he was approached by a, a faction to just take over. Not retire from the military, but kind of set up their own government and start running the nation um, with the military backing. And he declined. He said no. Um, he was given that chance at ultimate power after Britain had withdrawn, but before the colonies had decided what form of government they wanted. And he walked away. Kind of a, a latter-day Cincinnati. Um, he was set to retire. He wanted to retire. He wanted to enjoy that retirement. Um, but when his country called, he came again. They, they called him into chair of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. And immediately after the convention, he received unanimous electoral college votes to become the first president of the United States. Now, Washington had already had a sense that destiny rode with him. And he was very aware at this point of the weight of history bearing down on him. His was a newly created position. This had never existed before in history. Everything he did would set the tone for how the country ran. And he knew that. And he basically excelled at it. I, I mean, his was a policy to sit back and let the country run itself. Um, he didn't micromanage. He instituted the cabinet system. Uh, one of his talents was assigning young talent to the position for which they were best suited. And he was very good at that. Um, he advised, I mean, to the point when he retired, it, he, he did do one thing. Well, okay, he wasn't perfect by, by any metric, but I think the biggest failing he did was when he retired, he did advise John Adams, and that's taboo, right? And he, I think he was the only one to really do it, where he would advise a, for, a, a sitting president how to do things. But one of the things he did advise was to ignore nepotism and go ahead and uh, appoint his son John Quincy Adams to a position in his cabinet because he spotted that John Quincy had talent that needed to be brought into the fold. Now, Washington initially planned to retire for good after one term. All right, he, he didn't want to do more than that. He ultimately chose to run for a second term where, again, he was unanimously elected. Um, part of that decision to run again had to do with reputation. Um, if he had retired after one term, he thought the wolves would tear him apart, and I think he may have been right about that. Anyways, um, after eight years, he did retire. He said, okay, I'm done. I, I did my, my two terms. I understand this wasn't law back then, right? He could have run again and, and easily won again, although a third term might not have been unanimous with the Electoral College. But he would have won just on strength of reputation alone. But he said, no, I'm done. I want to re retire. I'm going to go and, and plan out my legacy and run my estates. 
one and so he did right and and he had this kind of legacy that he wanted to leave behind and he'd already built up a fair amount of legacy by this point again he was 65 i think when he retired because he didn't live too long after his retirement right one of the major points of concern for him was what to do with the slaves on his estate and this led to several dilemmas now washington had determined several years prior to this i think maybe before the war but it definitely came to to his attention after the war that it's fiscally infeasible to hold slaves long term and th this was basic math all right there were approximately 300 slaves at mount vernon only 100 of them were able to work so approximately two-thirds of his labor force were incapable of working due to either being too old or too young but he was still morally obliged to care for them and he could have just freed them and i kind of i do wonder if he had freed them immediately after the war how would that have affected the nation because he had the weight of public popularity behind him and that would have been such a strong voice if he would just said you're right i'm gonna free them this is awful i shouldn't be owning slaves nobody should be owning anybody we're a country built on freedom um it's not what happened obviously <laughs> unfortunately uh, he did eventually though come to view slavery itself as morally repugnant but he was a businessman which sounds absolutely awful but we know that that business business sense is what kept him from just freeing his slaves outright during his lifetime because he didn't just free them he was not opposed to selling them and recouping the loss of having maintained them um but what kept him from doing so was that he was morally opposed to breaking up families isn't that nice <laughs> not morally opposed to slavery but morally opposed to breaking up the families that they the family units that they had found on their own and his own slaves that he owned and that he could have legally sold had intermarried with the custis dower slaves which he did not own because those were tied to the custis estate remember his wife martha custis her dower slaves he could not sell but he would not sell his slaves that had intermarried with hers now that's an important distinction okay he had 124 approximately that he owned directly 40 were leased from neighbors the remaining 153 slaves that were on the mount vernon estate at the time of his death belonged to the custis estate could not liberate them could not sell them and he could have liberated his own but didn't that's i don't know in his will he did order them freed on martha's death um with the requirement that they be maintained for the rest of their lives on his estate because again if he once they were freed there's a possibility that they could be told get off the estate you don't live here you don't work here anymore and that again would have broken up the families so mea culpa maybe it was a mea culpa i don't know anyways um he 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 It's such an awful thing. Um, I don't know. It, he didn't. He, he was aware of the weight of history on him, and ultimately, he did do the right thing in freeing his slaves. I just, I don't think I'm wrong, and I think I probably speak for a lot of people when I say it would have been better if he'd done it when the war ended. Anyways, <laughs> Washington's legacy that multi-thousand acre estate worth five hundred and three thousand dollars was broken up equally among his 28 heirs now that was not at all usual back then um that's a massive split from tradition typically in order to preserve an estate it would be handed down as a piece to one primary heir and sub heirs might get a piece here a piece there but he broke it up equally that was a deliberate move on his part his legacy was his country he did not want a family legacy. He did not want to leave a political dynasty behind. So, on December 12, 1799, he went out 
Washington went out for his accustomed daily ride despite this fierce storm. When he returned, he sat down to dinner with their daily guests who rotated based on who came visiting that day. Um, and he sat down in wet clothes because he didn't want to keep his guests waiting, didn't want dinner to get cold. Uh, within several hours, he announced that he was not feeling well. Doctors were called, and within two days, he had died. That fast, just boom, he went. And that's it. It was a very full life. Um, it's succinctly told in less than 300 pages. Um, I enjoyed it very much. Um, it covered the high points. It made it easy to see why Washington was so revered in his time and well beyond the present day while not burying the darkness that inhibited him from true greatness. Um, it humanized him in a lot of ways. So, Anyways... I have included a link to Joseph Ellis' website. Um, thank you for watching. I hope to see you all next week. Bye.